It's a little bit about um, the presenters of um, our next session for today. So we've got three presenters, uh, Dr. Carmen Medina, who is coming to us from Dubai, but is originally from, and you can see more about her there, originally from Spain. And um, she was a Fulbright exchange teacher in 2001 and recently became an SFHEA. That looks like higher education uh, to me. And uh, there are other acronyms here, like she's been creating CEFR based online materials. You'll have to explain some of that. In any case, she uses both online and face to face, which is called blended learning. So, Dr. Medina, if there are other things that you'd like to add, feel free to do so. Our um, second presenter, along with uh, Dr. Medina, is Dr. Lana. Hi, Asset. I don't know if I pronounced that correctly, who's also um, in Dubai in the men's uh, college. And um, she, uh, you can see that she has a doctorate in education research. And again, she uh, did her research on blended learning, which is also my research. Um, so maybe we can talk about that sometimes. And um, she also has qualifications as a senior fellow, H-E-A. She has a master's degree in social science. And the second one was in m TESOL. That's teaching English to speakers, to second language learners, I presume. But you can correct me on that. And our third speaker is coming to us from the United States, Dr. Rosalind Billy, uh, who is uh, also a PhD um instructor in curriculum and instruction and uh, she also has an ma in education and leadership and teaching with a concentration um, yes okay um, great so i'll move the slide just let me know go yes please go to the objective slide i think that's three four that was just our introductions here we go Okay, so our objectives for today, thank you very much for joining us. Our objectives for today are four. We would like to develop an understanding of how to build online courses and or blended learning courses, develop UDL principles, that's universal design for learning principles, and integrate them into our courses in order to cater for all learner abilities, how to use a storyboard to create content and organize sessions, and a theoretical the theoretical perspectives that uh, that are lie behind the tools and strategies that we use in our while we burn we build our courses in order to engage our students. So um, most teachers worldwide will agree that students are finding it increasingly difficult to just sit through lectures and take notes. So as a matter of fact, due to the amounts of information that are available on the internet, it seems rather recurrent to actually put through students through these lectures and you know, simply make them take notes. The onset of the internet and the seemingly endless supply of digital tools offer a myriad of possibilities to make learning engaging and meaningful. Two of these possibilities are online and blended learning courses. Blended learning, which is a combination of offline and online assignments that are destined to increase satisfactory learning and teaching. How do we cater for these needs and possibilities? Well, we are firm believers in online and blended learning. And we have seen the brilliant results that this path has rendered as the three of us have created and delivered a number of online courses. Steven Ansbacher, back in 1994, already, he's a pioneer, one of the pioneers in online learning, back in 1994, already said that it's not about the technology, it's about the learning, it's about the content. And we subscribe to this, this quote, we should not use technology for technology's sake. And I think that most professionals that develop online courses would agree with this. And in the words of one of our IT colleagues at HCT, Vaishali Samani, she says that the tools should work for the teachers and for the students, not make it increasingly difficult. 
if there's a tool, if there's something that we're using that is making it difficult for us as teachers to produce materials or for the students to follow, then we should discard that because technology is here to help us. It's not here to hinder us. So students have enough technology simply by using their phones, right? And we want to make this, the learning for them, meaningful. The way that in the past a blackboard or even handouts would, would do. Um, so that's what we're, we want to use the technology for. Um, can you please go on to the next slide? Uh, what would we like you to take away from this session? Well, perhaps develop an interest in creating online and blended learning courses and to give you some ideas and strategies, tools as to how to develop online or blended learning courses. So we've been asked, next slide please. We've been asked to create a blended or an online course. So what do we do? Apart from panic and say, oh my goodness, will I be able to do this? The first step is to analyze the content that we are going to develop. Now, is it going to be a fully online course or is it going to be a blended learning course? Because if it's going to be a blended learning course, it's going to be slightly different. Why? Because we have to decide which content is going to be online and which content we are going to develop face to face. So how are we going to design the course? We've been using storyboards, but before going through the storyboard, we're going to have a look at something called backward design, which in words of Wiggins and McTighe, is instructors consider the learning goals of the course first. In other words, we have a look at what we want the students to do, and then we work back from there. These learning goals are going to embody the knowledge and the skills that instructors want their students to have learned when they leave the course. Backward design is going to involve three stages. First of all, we want to identify the results that we desire. Secondly, we want to discern, determine the artifacts that we're going to use to prove that learning has taken place. And thirdly, we want to design activities that will make students um, make learning happen. Um, can you go on to the next slide, please? Okay, and the next one, building an online course. Okay, I think you went too far. Okay, so the idea of a storyboard, believe it or not, was developed in the 1930s when Walt Disney Studios animator Webb Smith created the idea of drawing scenes on separate sheets of paper and pinning them up on a bulletin board to tell a story in sequence. Basically, that is what we do in a storyboard. In our experience, the storyboard is our roadmap. It tells us what to do, when to do it, why we are doing it, and how we are going to do it. In other words, we work back from what we want our students to learn and incorporate the content and the assessment tools which will reach that goal. Do we have a copy of the storyboard present? Can we have a look at it? Oh, Nellie, did we lose you? No, you didn't lose me. Okay. Is there any way that you can authorize me to share my screen? That would be great. That's what I suggested before um, because um, it's too complicated. I'm doing too many things at the same time. So yes, it because would be great. Because if there's any way that I can share, you can authorize me to share the storyboard. Um, yes, share of my course. Screen? Yes, that's exactly what I want you to do. Uh, okay. So what about the other presenters? When do you want them to speak so that I know? Um, I I'm just going to go through were... the storyboard, and once I finish the storyboard, then okay. yeah, Rosalind takes it from, okay, from great. the storyboard. All right, so you've got a co-host, so you could, pr you could do anything. You could um, you can share your screen. Ah, here we go. Do Great. It. Okay, can you see the screen now? Yep. Yes. Okay. So the part that you see that is highlighted in blue is the part that would correspond to your own to your own organization. In other words, the course title, the department, the course, the office, your office hours, and so forth, okay? Um, the course environment refers to the platform that you're going to use, whether it be 
Blackboard, Moodle, and so forth. The credit hour expectations, if you're at university level, it will be the credit hours or, and or the, the hours that you're going to be teaching, the days and so forth, okay? This is where we're going to start with our backward design, okay? So what will you learn? This is an example from our Linguistics for Educators course that Rosalind and I developed for Grandview University last year. And what we did was we included the objectives first. You usually limit your objectives to five or so, like the most important objectives that you will you want the students to achieve during the course. And then the activities that demonstrate learning are the evidence that, uh, that the students have actually covered the objectives that you set yourself. Then in t key technology key exposures, it's the minimum requirements that students will need, the participants in your course will need to, uh, to be able to successfully get through the course. That is, it range, ranges anywhere from, do you, have an e do you know how to create an email to, do you know how to create a PowerPoint, an infograph, and so on. And how the course will be, be taught refers to whether it will be online or blended. The resources needed for learning, this is where we, we include our references and the graded assignments. As you can see here, the graded assignments, that's the first module. And the course that we created for Linguistics for Educators was graded on 100%. And these are the, the grades for the percentage grades for the first assignment. As you can see, the assignment there were several things like discussion, previous knowledge quiz, introduction, and so forth. And then the assignment was 7.5%, which was the most important part of the module. In other words, where the student reflected that they had actually covered the content that we were ref that we wanted them to cover. The technology necessary is any, uh, as well as the LMS that you're using, Blackboard or Moodle, do they need anything else? Will they be needing Google Drive or Dropbox and so forth? Then. What are your responsibilities is what the participants have to do in order to carry out the activities. In other words, it's, it's a bit of a contract or an agreement as to what the students um, are going to promise that they're going to do in order to reach the, the goals. The evaluation rubric is the different rubrics that you're going to use. This is very important for the students because they have to know exactly how you're going to evaluate them. Okay, so we had, we had, rubrics for completion of assignments, for the essay, for the portfolio, it's all going to depend on the content that you are going to include. And then the grade scale is going to depend on what grading you're going to use in your, in your school or your, or your university. These are the gradings that were used for Grandview High School, uh, sorry, Grandview University. Um, okay. uh, this is where the content starts. This is, we included general knowledge skills that range, and these you can adapt as well, okay? So the storyboard is a recommendation. This is the one that we have been using, the one that we've been working with, but the important thing is that you develop your own storyboard that you match your contents and um, your assessment and so forth, and you make it your own. Um, we included um, for general knowledge skill, general knowledge and skills, everything re ranging from assessing the merits of contrasting theories and explanations, thinking and judging independently, critically judging, and so forth. Because as I said before, this was a linguistics, a linguistics course. Then what professional skills do we want them to review and to use? Well, um, understanding, analysis, uh, recognizing problems, developing problem solving skills, communicating effectively and respectfully, following etiquette rules, and so forth. And um, then the, the actual content. Um, and here again is where we can see in learning outcomes the backward design. Each of the modules, each of the weeks, or each of the units, as you wish, whatever terminology you wish to use. First of all, we had our learning outcomes. That's what we want the students to be able to do. Then we have the assessment activities. That is what you're going to do to prove that you have reached your, the objective of the course, the learning outcomes. 
then the content and the procedures, the activities that you're going to follow and so forth. And then we had extra helpful resources and this was going to cater for uh, the different learning abilities in case there was somebody that needed more reinforcement or needed, um, was ahead and wanted more information. So building an online course. Um, a study by Chen and Chow in 2016 reported that students' learning styles were significantly related to online participation and that online participation in networked learning and materials development was significantly related to learning achievement and course satisfaction. Their study highlighted not only the crucial role of learning styles in online participation, but also the importance of individual constructivism. In other words, the knowledge that the students themselves can build during their effective online learning. Considering the universal design for learning framework in our, in our course design will, first of all, draw on the strengths of all students and meet their unique needs and extend their learning. Secondly, it will be flexible. It will, it will allow us to be flexible in our teaching and assessment strategies, as well as in the materials and media. It will ensure that students have a comfortable access to the different resources according to their different capabilities. It will avoid unnecessary complexity in communication, instruction, and allow for effective feedback, and provide a safe, caring, and engaging, inclusive, and respectful environment for all of students. Roz, would you like to take it from here? Are you ready? Rosalind? I'm here, can you hear me now? Okay, yeah. Yeah, okay, so to understand UDL, you need to understand what the three principles are, the three main principles, but there are actually four principles and taking that into consideration when you're designing an online or blended course. The first consideration to have is to provide multiple means of engagement to get your students engaged through the activities you choose to incorporate on your online or blended course that they are motivated and they're challenged. And that is the why of learning. The second concept to consider while developing a blend blended and online course is the principle of multiple means of representation. Here's where you gather all the information and identify and provide all the information in multiple means of accessibility to your students. Your students have various learning styles and capabilities, so if you represent the material or the content that you're teaching both in a blended or online environment, that you are then able to cater to all the needs. The point of the UDL model is to take away any barriers to learning for your students. So even we do this, we practice this in the classroom, but we also have to practice the same concept when we're designing online and blended learning courses. The third principle is to provide multiple means of action and expression, which basically is the how of learning. How you teach your students to express that they show that they are learning. That could be multiple means of different types of projects. They can have papers, essays, various multiple means of showing you that they have showed mastery of the content that you are teaching in a blended or an online format. The fourth principle, which isn't added here, that you don't see on your screen, but was added in 2009 by CAS, the inventors of the UDL model, was multiple means of assessment. We know that we have a lot of students that have test anxiety and we can't always just have to give formal assessment. We can give informal assessments, not just summative, but informal as well. So having uh, multiple means of assessment allows your students, again, to show their means of understanding of the content in the online or blended form. So yes, you can give quizzes, you can give a formal exam. However, you can also give projects and presentations that could be done on in a blended or online um, environment. Can I have the next slide, please? Lana, that's you. Lana is going to speak about constructivism. If you can un uh, mute, unmute her mic, that would be great. Okay, now I'm unmuted. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. 
of the theoretical perspective behind uh, blended learning and any online uh, courses uh, is, is the constructivism that, and social constructivism. So a bit of a background um, was already presented by uh, Carmen about the importance of individualized constructivism, which means that learning always is uh, built upon knowledge that a student already knows and can build prior knowledge and experience, which we know as schema. Collaborative learning team uh, work uh, are important um, in this kind of paradigm and developed through different projects, uh, even game-based learning activities. This uh, slide shows you uh, some of the different uh, theories behind uh, constructivism. And we have the important um, introduction of John Dewey's uh, experience and education. So experiential learning is basically what uh, learners um, can experience and do in a course. And that, could, that is a very important part in a blended learning and in uh, our online learning uh, course because uh, you want still the learner to experience uh, uh, a variety of uh, things in order to construct their own knowledge. They build their uh, knowledge on uh, their prior uh, experiences and they, and through different scaffolding uh, uh, activities that the uh, teacher creates, uh, this knowledge is constructed. Uh, now, uh, in an online learning, uh, that needs to be developed uh, slightly different than um, in the face-to-face -face in a traditional classroom because uh, experiences uh, and collaborative work uh, can sometimes be easier than when you are face-to-face. -face. But in an online environment, you have to create that uh, environment for learners to uh, be able to, to have the same sense of bringing their own personal experiences. Um, and uh, Vygotsky also talked about that. And these are, I would suggest that you have a look at the different theories presented in here. Uh, but some of them, um, are really important like Dewey and uh, Bruner's anchored instruction where you also uh, have to pay attention to how you keep on anchoring the main points that you want to learn, uh, the, instruct, uh, the learner to take. The next slide is basically building the uh, with a proficiency level that you should have. And I think uh, Carmen will take... Roslyn. Oh, Roslyn, okay. Roslyn? Okay, there we are. I can, sorry, I couldn't get unmuted. There I was, <laughs> now I am. All right, so when you're building an online course, you have to consider some levels of proficiency if you're dealing with EFL and ELL learners in a online environment. One thing to consider is that you're dealing with, if you're dealing with an academic content course, that your ELL and F ELF learner will have to have a, a proficiency level close to proficient because you're dealing with academic language and academic learning. So, but that is just, with that being said, it's not to say that this cannot happen um, if it's a language course. If it's a language course that you're teaching a language online, of course, there is no level of proficiency required. Where here, when you're dealing with an online course, you have to consider the academic language being con in the content area that you're teaching. That is where you're going to be thinking about um, proficiency levels of an EFL or ELL learner. But if you're dealing with um, just, uh, language learning course, then no, you would not need to worry about proficiency levels. Next slide, please. In uh, thinking about how to engage your participants online, a very uh, a simple three kind of uh, uh, phases that uh, we would suggest that you think about is how is the learner going to get the knowledge? What are the different uh, ways that you are going to present uh, the knowledge and the content? And then the second phase you have to ask, try to consider or ask yourself is how is the learner going to connect uh, to uh, the knowledge that you are bringing to their own life uh, and work experience? Uh, basically, this connection is 
what is related to experiential learning and this is where they start constructing their own learning in uh, practicing the last phase is uh, offering how are you going to offer opportunities for learner to practice and to discover their learning through doing and uh, through application which is again also um, experiential learning so these three easy uh, questions to ask yourself would actually help you design your online um, uh, activities and uh, course um, in a way for the learner to construct their knowledge. The tools, uh, this uh, uh, slide shows you a list of different tools and strategies uh, that uh, we have used um, in uh, our uh, uh, online course. And uh, the uh, technology tools that we have decided on uh, were based on what kind of experiences the learner is going to get and how can we get them to collaborate um, online with other learners. So um, what we have um, used and that worked well, we've used the uh, uh, Google community as a way for learners to collaborate, the classroom for them to construct their own learning, Padlet is another uh, tool for easy collaboration. Now the uh, pres the uh, content, the way it was delivered, um, and the way we, we, the first stage where how do you give the knowledge to the learners were through the Zoom weekly meetings. We've used videos. Uh, interviewing guest speakers was very important because we wanted to not only bring my, our own knowledge, but invite, invite other uh, uh, not uh, P, uh, experts in the field to give their own perspective and then you, uh, then uh, learners can bring in can decide and build their own uh, knowledge based on all the input that they're getting the review sessions uh, were basically also video recordings of um, uh, going over the what happened the previous week and moving on to the next week that was an important part because in an experiential learning, the cycle is not just learning, applying, and then um, uh, moving on to the next level. It, reflection is uh, a very important part. So the review sessions were the reflective part where we go back and think about um, how it went and what can we do next. And this is why we've developed the question and answer feedback session where uh, we looked at uh, the questions that were asked and recorded our answers to them. So uh, that there are multiple ways of um, providing input, just uh, as Roz uh, explained that in the UDL, uh, one of the principles is using multiple uh, ways of uh, presenting your information to meet the different learning styles. The same, um, with the, uh, some uh, further uh, technology tools that seem effective was using Nearpod as a way of uh, moving a lesson and it incorporates a lot of collaborative uh, and input from uh, the learners. Learners themselves organically uh, started building their own live binders, using Pinterest, uh, creating Sway presentations, which are again, meets their own uh, learning styles. Uh, the strategies uh, summarized uh, are basically, the most important thing is to have the frequent and varied interaction with the participants. Uh, feedback needs to be prompt and um, always answer the questions. Uh, and we try to do that not only in written format, but also in video format, so that the online uh, learner has a sense uh, of, um, a familiarity with the uh, with the present the uh, educator um, also uh, an important thing was having frequent meetings between uh, the um, uh, presenters and the collaborators the teachers because that that helped us to keep on reflecting and improving the online course and uh, Based on our frequent uh, meetings, we've offered additional materials, created uh, new venues for interaction and input, and for uh, participants to um, experience and construct their own learning. And all of that can happen organically in an online environment, but it, it has to be a continuous, um, uh, continuous uh, reflection and evaluation of what is going on. Um, in the learning. Next slide. 
I think our time is almost over. Roslyn, it's your turn to take over the blended learning environment. Roslyn? Mute yourself. Okay, there we go. I got it. It just gives me a little bit to unmute myself. Okay, so blended learning environment. Blended learning environment um, is an interesting thing because it's not traditionally, it's defined as a 50-50 um, environment where 50% of the time is online and 50% of the time is face-to-face. -face. However, that may be the traditional um, definition, but it doesn't necessarily have to work that way. Uh, blended learning could be used as a flipped classroom. Uh, blended learning could be 80% face-to-face, 20% online. It has a different uh, scenarios um, to meet the learner's needs and the instructor's comfortability with the online learning environment. Blended learning environment also presents, uh, we have students that may not be comfortable with online. Complete online, you have to use complete learner autonomy and time management. Whereas blended, there's still a face-to-face -face element where participants can still have that collaborative effort with their course mates and with the instructor. Whereas the instructor is the complete facilitator of the learners in the online learning environment. Next slide, please. Now, criteria for online learning environment, you would definitely need a reliable LMS system and a wide range of activities like we've mentioned before. And that is reasoning because of the type of learning styles that you have and having the fact that it is a face, there is face-to-face -face time and uh, non-face-to-face time. Next slide. Uh, you can go to the next one. There are some advantages and disadvantages of using, yeah, that one, uh, both online and blended learning. Like I mentioned before, online learning is the complete autonomy of the learner where, and the instructor becomes the facilitator of their learning. However, in a blended on, um, learning environment, the instructor is not just the facilitator, but they're still there. There's still that co personal connection that uh, a lot of individuals like to have, whereas in an online learning environment, the complete autonomy could be difficult because of time management and how um, to incorporate all the tasks and keeping on top of that. But they both have the fundamentals of engaging students, being online, and timing and pacing and digital communication. Next slide. So when we're talking about proficiency levels of EFL and ELL learners in a blended and online environment, um, there is just a proficiency of technology because that's the good thing about the blended uh, learning environment um, is that they have a proficiency of technology and they're able to navigate the system and there's still that face-to-face -face element where students could have that interaction with their instructor and be able to communicate and ask questions in that live environment. At this time, we open up to questions that anyone may have. We will take a look at the chat box and we can see and we can jump in and answer any questions you may have. Nelly, I'll stop sharing my screen now. You don't have to. You can keep the screen. Oh, it's a nice... I was just, uh, we were just going to say thank you.